Well, 2023 has begun with no shortage of controversy and military conflicts around the world. As we look at news sources and online sites, we may see a lot of information supporting one side or the other of a narrative. But there are those seeking peaceful resolutions, including Canadian peace activists, writer and blogger Eve Engler, who joins me today from Montreal to talk about what in the world is going on and where does Canada fit into it all? Eve, welcome back to Bridge City News. Great to have you on again. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so Yves, looking over the articles on your website, yveengler.com, it seems like there are wars and rumors of wars breaking out all across the world. And for the past year, everyone's been so focused on Ukraine. So do you think that the military operation in Ukraine is serving as a distraction to keep focus and attention away from the other wars and conflicts? Well, I think there are people in the American military, which the Canadian military increasingly uh, echoes, who see what's going on in Ukraine um, as a uh, proxy war with Russia, and they see it as a, as successful in the sense that Ukraine Ukrainians are doing most of the dying, but Russia is has been weakened, and they see that as a possible model for a conflict with China, specifically over Taiwan. And you have a uh, leading American uh, four-star general a couple of days ago saying expects there to be a war, expects there to be a war with uh, China by 2025. You have another about two weeks ago, a top American military official saying that uh, directly comp contrasting what they did in Ukraine uh, with regards to pre-positioning weapons and tactical uh, intelligence support for the Ukrainian military. And uh, equating that with uh, with Taiwan and th the work the U.S. is doing in terms of building up a, a military presence, uh, weaponry, et cetera, uh, not only in Taiwan, but also with regards to Japan, Philippines, uh, to prepare for a war with uh, with 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 China. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, obviously what's going on in Ukraine is is the. Uh, uh, worst of the uh, uh, conflicts, uh, wars going on in, in, in the world today. Um, uh, in recent years, what's happened in Yemen has also been uh, equally uh, or similarly kind of uh, violent and destructive, though receives a whole lot less attention. But the uh, the war in Ukraine, or what really should be understood at this point as a, as a uh, NATO-Russia proxy war, uh, does still have the chance of uh, escalating to something... Um, you know, incredibly scary because we do have you know the two main uh, nuclear armed uh, powers in the world uh, that are you know ever so close to being directly at war with each other, uh, and that obviously is uh, something that uh, no one in the world should even want to uh, to contemplate. No, absolutely not. In your mind, who's benefiting from all these conflicts? I mean, overall, it's obviously the everyday people who lose out in wars, but who's benefiting here? Well, the obvious beneficiaries are the arms manufacturers. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, there's uh, you know a contract, uh, the Rochtel Canada's contract, ninety million dollar uh, contract that was recently given. Looks like it was with uh, no bid that the uh, federal government, the Trudeau government, gave to this uh, uh, light armored vehicle manufacturer in uh, in Ontario uh, to provide two hundred uh, vehicles to the Ukrainian military. Obviously, that's uh, that's good for the uh, the shareholders of that company. Uh, the New York Times just reported on a uh, Ontario company that received a three hundred ninety one million dollar U S contract to provide uh, shells, bo the bodies of shells for the Pentagon uh, to produce because of just so many uh, so much artillery being used on both sides, the Russians and the Ukrainian side. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, a company like Bombardier, Montreal-based aerospace company, announced that it was really increasing its its uh, involvement in um, in uh, uh, arms production t tied to uh, the war in, in in Ukraine. So, so arms companies are are the clear uh, beneficiaries. Uh, militaries often like, uh, as hard as it may be to believe, but there are people who do like. Uh, wars from the standpoint of just you know individuals who find themselves who you know like the the uh the um uh, sort of uh 
danger and 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 stuff like that. Um, but uh, but clearly, the main uh, victims of all this are are everyday Ukrainians, and more specifically, people who live in the eastern part of the country. People in the west of Ukraine have been relatively uh, people who you know live in the east of the country have just been uh, just you know horrible. But this has actually been going on for about eight years in the east of Ukraine. There's been you know fighting going on uh, in the Donbass for for eight years. So so this is uh, um, you know escalation from the standpoint of uh, resources. You know Canada has now spent about uh, five billion dollars in assistance uh, to the Ukraine. Uh, both military assistance, about a, toward about one and a half billion in military assistance, and uh, three billion or so in uh, in different kind of um, uh, financial assistance to the Ukrainian government, which would have collapsed uh, financially without the uh, the outside su- outside support. Um, so that is starting to you know cost the Canadian taxpayer a certain amount of uh, of, of resources, and the U.S. is even you know it's about a hundred billion dollar uh, contribution from the U.S. Um, so there are real uh, the real costs, but there are also you know the oil companies have done well by the price of oil going up. There's you know it's it's you know contradictory um, dynamics that play out, and there's also of course people in uh, some of the most impoverished parts of the world. The price of of foodstuffs going up because of the because of the war has been incredibly incredibly damaging in parts of Africa and uh, parts of the Middle East. Um, but yeah, I think that it's clear that. Um, Everyday Canadians, everyday Americans, certainly not Ukrainians, are 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 are, are you know are not doing well by this. Uh, but there are uh, uh, people who um, who see the world from a military lens, uh, who see the world as a you know great power competition between China with you know with Russia with China, and you know worry about sort of American led domination of the world. They they see this conflict as actually uh, uh, serving their purposes, um, while there are so many uh, uh, individuals who are harmed by it. Mm-hmm. What about the the leaders and the politicians of these Western countries? Are they benefiting in any way, and what is the benefit? Well, I think that there was a certain amount of kind of rallying behind uh, the um, the liberal government. Uh, back in February, when Russia uh, instigated the you know large scale uh, invasion, um, they the liberals there was a lot, obviously a lot of controversy around the uh, protests in Ottawa at that point, uh, and uh, and the liberals sort of benefited from from the NDP and the Conservatives sort of uh, you know, sort of rallying behind uh, let's let's help out Ukraine kind of kind of thinking and. and and uh, so, so kind of war, war type thinking, war type, I guess hysteria, if you want to call it that, um, often is beneficial, beneficial to leaders who find that media criticism lessens, and uh, and there's a certain amount of kind of uh, uh, a support that um, that plays out. Um, but uh, I think some of that's a little bit fleeting. Obviously, you know, from Zelensky's standpoint, that's been beneficial to Zelensky. There's, you know, the, all the opposition press in the Ukraine has been basically shut down, and you know, the, you know, there's the the very um, uh, kind of raucous uh, usual Ukrainian politics have led to uh, less of that. And probably the same thing with regards to Vladimir Putin. Putin has had a, a certain amount of kind of nationalism that's uh, played out within within Russia. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd say the politicians uh, certainly haven't done uh, haven't done bad by uh, by the war. Okay, even of course, uh, speaking of politicians, you are a voice for peace here in Canada, and you certainly can ruffle some feathers. So, can you maybe talk about your most recent incident with the Canadian ambassador to the UN, Bob Ray, and the event that Christian Freeland was speaking at? Yeah, uh, uh, myself, uh, Dimitri Lascaris, and Tamara Lawrence, uh, two other um, uh, anti-war activists uh, in Ottawa, at the University of Ottawa, a week ago, we uh, we interrupted Canada's ambassador to UN, Bob Ray, uh, during a speech he was given. And uh, my intervention was focused on the fact that he, he was deceiving uh, uh, Canadians about uh, his support for international law, specifically in the context of uh, of the war in Ukraine, he he correctly notes that Russia's invasion 
is contrary to international law, clear act of aggression, and of course is is, is very brutal, uh, which I you know agree with uh, Mr. Ray on. Uh, but where I don't agree with Mr. Ray is that 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 he actually respects international law because in recent weeks the Canadian uh, UN mission has voted against multiple resolutions uh, upholding international law with regards to the Palestinians. And I pointed that out to Ray, and I pointed out that he's also voted, he also voted against the resolution uh, criticizing uh, neo-Nazism. He voted against the resolution uh, uh, supporting the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And so he's voted against all kinds of resolutions that I think are you know, progressive, internationalist-minded resolutions that that he, in his own rhetoric, he claims to be to be upholding, but yet he, as Canada's representative to the UN, is actually voting uh, against. And then I, I I discussed his role in uh, Haiti, and Bob Ray has taken over the last three or four months has taken a leading role in pushing for a foreign uh, military intervention in Haiti. And he takes this role as if he's a sort of almost like a colonial governor, where he has, you know, told the CBC that that Haiti should, uh, you know, recreate its military. He has intervened and given his opinion and what should happen in Haiti in a whole bunch of different fronts, and um, and that's completely contrary to uh, you know respecting sovereignty, and it's just an extension of. Um, at least two decades of uh, Canadian government uh, intervention in Haiti, which uh, began, of course, with ousting of the elected president in uh, 2004. We, the U.S., France, and Canada sent troops to oust the uh, elected president, uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, as well as uh, thousands of other elected officials. And and, uh, and just since that time, that, that brought in a U.N. occupation that lasted for 13 years, that U.N. occupation. Um, we supported a coup government for two years. It killed thousands of people. Then the UN occupation uh, would ultimately bring cholera into the country because the UN forces were uh, were dumping their waste, um, specifically their feces, where uh, people were drinking from water stream. And that's what brought cholera to Haiti that led to tens of thousands of people died from cholera. More than a million people became ill with cholera. And even after this happened, UN troops, UN bases continued to dump their, their waste in uh, water streams that people uh, bathed in, um, and drank from. It was just an incredible disregard for Haitian life. Yeah. And it was kind of reflective of the whole um, point of the UN force being there, which was to uh, to take over from the U.S., Canadian, and French troops that ousted the elected government, that backed a coup government, uh, and uh, and really didn't have the interests of of, of Haitians at, at heart. And so Bob Ray's uh, over the past four or five months has really taken the lead in in shaping Canadian policy on Haiti, and that's a policy of uh, you know eighteen months ago. Um, the core group, which is uh, led by the U.S. and Canada, representative of foreign ambassadors in Haiti, uh, they appointed the the current leader of Haiti, Ariel Henry, was appointed by the core group, uh, and he has overseen a uh, further descent of uh, of of uh, Haitian affairs, and he has absolutely no uh, electoral legitimacy. He wasn't elected. He's not constitutional. Has has very limited popular support, and we're backing. We're backing Ariel Henry, um, and Bob Ray is a you know a major player in the Trudeau government in in um, uh, shaping that policy. So I so I challenged him on uh, on that, and I think that uh, so when you look at what Bob Ray says about um, the bad things that Russia is doing in in um, in Ukraine, you know he's correct. Uh, but the reality is Bob Ray supported the bombing of Libya. He supported the war in Afghanistan. He's, you know, voted against all these UN resolutions upholding international law. So he's not somebody that we should take uh, uh, too seriously when he uh, makes uh, high-minded uh, moral condemnations of, uh, of Russia's uh, uh, actions. Thanks so much. Uh, we have to let you go here. We're running out of time, but thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot for having me. Absolutely. That was Eve Engler, Canadian peace activist, writer, and blogger at yveengler.com.